guys, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio, here live via Skype with James Jacob Prash, and this is this week's Bible study, of course, with Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Thank you for joining us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you thankfully and prayerfully, asking you, Lord God, to pour your spirit upon us, to open our eyes to the glory and meaning of your word. And as always, Lord God, give us the wisdom and courage to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also, in Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake. Abino Malkeno, anakta modim lahal advarecha, ana adonai tishpoch rochachecha aleinu, lepachazdecha abba. Ten lano hachokma vehameretz, lo rak nishmoa, aval gam ken la asot ma shekatuv bedvarecha. Ana adonai tishtak et inam shelano, et tiferet shodvarecha. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach Adonenu. Amen. We have some friends listening in Israel, so we pray in two languages. Let's continue. We're looking at the subject this week of the clouds, the clouds in Scripture. What do they mean? We never want to put more emphasis on something than Scripture does, but we certainly don't want to put less. As we always point out, or have frequently pointed out, an essential maxim of studying God's Word is everything in God's Word is important, everything. If something is in the Bible even once, if something is ordained to be included in Scripture even once, it's important. But if it's there twice, it's more important. If it's there three times, it's more important still. And if it occurs in both Testaments, it's even more important. The more times it's in there, particularly if it occurs in both Testaments, that grades its level of importance. There's nothing that's not important, but there are some things more important than others. Jesus made this clear. When we talked about things like straining a gnat, swallowing a camel. But let's look at the clouds. Turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse. We'll begin in the Olivet Discourse about the return of Jesus this morning in verse 30. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all of the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of God coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Now remember when Jesus came the first time, there was the sign. The Magi, the wise men, as it were, saw the sign. Well, what happens in his first coming happens in his second. The second thing we see here is the tribes of the earth shall mourn. With the crucifixion of Jesus, only half the verse is included in the Gospel of St. John. Uh, chapter 19 in John's Passion Narrative, verse 32 says, this, sorry, verse 37 says this, and again another scripture, they will look upon him who they have pierced. This quotes from Zechariah chapter 12. They will look upon him who they have pierced, and mourn as one mourns for an only son. They did not weep bitterly over him, like the weeping over a firstborn, as Zachariah said. Instead, most of them were yelling, crucify him. Therefore, only half the verse is included. The rest of the verse of the prophecy of Zechariah 12 must therefore be fulfilled at a future point. And we read what that future point is, a direct reference to Matthew 24:30. We read it in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, he's coming with the clouds again. Same as Matthew 24, 30. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So be it, amen. Quoting from the Septuagint version of Zechariah 12. So we had the original prophecy of Zechariah 12, 1 to 10. Now look upon him, or upon me, it's in the first person in the Hebrew canon. Jesus speaking by the Holy Spirit through Zechariah in the first person. They'll look upon me who they have pierced, worn as one mourns for an only son. But when they crucified Jesus, when the Romans crucified him, in John 19, only the first half of the verse is quoted. The rest must happen at a future point. Beware of the errors of hyperpreterism. 
those who say that these prophecies of the return of Jesus were completely fulfilled in 70 AD. That is a logical and a theological impossibility. It is complete and utter nonsense. It is held by certain reconstructionists. It is heard by Dominion theologians. It is certainly held by the people who followed Rausus Rashtuni, people like Rick Godwin in America and so forth, who subscribe to the erroneous teachings of the late Gary North. People like this, it's completely a false teaching. All of the prophecies concerning Jesus must be fulfilled. And that prophecy of Zechariah 12 was only half fulfilled, according to John. Revelation chapter 1 tells us it will be fulfilled at a future point. And as we see in Matthew 24, Jesus says the same thing as Revelation 1-7 and verse 30 of the 24th chapter of Matthew in the Olivet Discourse. So the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, coming on the clouds of the sky. Notice the clouds. Let's continue to Matthew chapter 26, please. The 26th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, and we're looking at verse 64. Matthew 26, 64. Jesus said to him, you've said it yourself. Nonetheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. He's again coming on the clouds. That's the second time. Third time is Revelation 1-7. Let's look, please, very briefly at Matthew 13 26. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Once again, the fourth time, the clouds. Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 14, verse 62, please. Once more. I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of of heaven. What is this talking about? Why has Jesus said this five times in the New Testament? Five. Four in the Gospels, once in Revelation. Why does he keep reiterating the clouds, the clouds, the clouds, the clouds? Now let's understand that the Greek word for cl clouds is nephilon. Nephilon. Singular would be nephos. Nephos. Nephilon. Okay. Anim in Hebrew, but Nephos in, in Greek. There may be a uh, predisposition to confuse this with Nephilim because it would seem to have the same root. Now, one is Greek, one is Hebrew. The two words are not related as such, not etymologically, and only to a very limited degree typologically. Nephos, Nephos, okay, the clouds. It's not the same as the Nephilim in Genesis chapter 6 or anything of this nature. What are the clouds? Well, the clouds are revealed to us in their meaning in the epistles. We read in, in the epistles in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the following. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, martyrion, surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He's coming on the clouds. Let's look, please, at the book of Acts, chapter 1, at the ascension of Jesus. Verse 9 of Acts 1, Masea Shlichim. And after he'd said these things, he was lifted up, and while they were looking on, a cloud received him out of their sight. There's a cloud again in the New Testament. Martyrion, martyrion. There is an unprovable 
possibility. I'm not teaching this dogmatically. I, I'm not sure it could anyway be true, but I can't rule out the possibility of it being true. Who were these witnesses whom he went up with in some kind of figurative sense? When Jesus died, Old Testament saints were seen walking around Jerusalem. It may have been them ascending into heaven with him. I can't rule that out, but I'm certainly not teaching it as a doctrine. I don't have much light on that beyond what I've said at the present time. But he's went up with the clouds. And we are told by the angels immediately afterwards, why do you stand looking at the sky? This Jesus who's been taken from you will come in just the same way you've watched him go into heaven. He will come back the way he went, with the clouds. Now, this tells us something that refers back to the Olivet Discourse. Many false Christs will come in the last days saying, I am he. If he's in the wilderness, they tell you, don't believe it. He's in the inner rooms, don't go there. Be careful of anyone or anything that says that Jesus will return in any physical sense prior to the parousia and prior to the second coming, okay? Prior to the second coming. Uh, it's not going to happen that way. It just is not. There are many heresies teaching otherwise, one of which is the obvious heresy of the Roman Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, where they teach that the bread and the wine constitutes a literal physical return of Jesus when the priest says, hoc est corpus meum, where it's not just do this in memory of me, in remembrance of me, zota sulu zikroni, which is what Jesus actually would have prayed, but it is actually the return of Christ physically. They call it the blessed sacrament, and they worship the bread and wine and pray to it as a physical presence of Jesus. And then he dies again sacramentally in their false belief, even though we're told repeatedly in Hebrews and by Peter, he dies once and for all in a perfect sacrifice. And then they eat him in a cannibalistic ritual called the Mass, which is, of course, completely outlawed by the apostles in the book of Acts chapter 15. The ritual consumption of blood is demonic. We're told not to do it. Even if it was his real blood, they shouldn't be drinking it. Now, this is one example of he didn't come with the clouds, therefore it's not him of the teachings that some evangelicals in Great Britain have subscribed to, the pain and wear heresy, which says that just as before the ascension, Jesus appeared 10 times before he was taken into heaven after his resurrection, that his return will be the same. He'll make multiple appearances on earth before the rapture and resurrection. This is a completely false teaching and a false doctrine, and some believers have bought into it, but it is completely false. Well, he'll come back the same way with the clouds. The description of this is seen in the book of Acts, in the martyrdom of Stephen. When Stephen was martyred, put to death, he looked up into heaven. And when he looked up into heaven, what did he see? Well, we know what he saw. He saw Jesus at the right hand of the Father in the book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 56. Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Same description. It also matches what Paul says. When the Lord comes, he'll bring our loved ones who died in the Lord with him. If you lose a Christian loved one, Remember, it's a temporary separation. They will be returning with Jesus. The first thing we will see, Jesus. Second thing we will see, you will see God. The second thing we will see is our loved ones with him. He always comes with the clouds, those who bore witness to him, the martyrion, some of which, some of whom were actually martyred and paid with their temporal lives in testimony to the belief and confession that he is Lord and that he is risen. So, we see what the clouds are, the nephilon. They are the witnesses of the Lord in figure. That's what they mean. This comes as, this comes as early as, as we have a biblical record of from the book of Daniel, chapter 7. Verse 13, 
Read with me, please, if you will, from the Old Testament, the Tanakh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. All of these New Testament references, statements by Jesus, hearken back to the Hebrew Scriptures, the prophet Daniel chapter 13. Seven, And, of course, we read in Daniel chapter 7, I kept looking, that horn, that being the Antichrist, was waging war with the saints and overpowering them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And at that time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. It's at that time. Do not believe the false doctrines of dominion theology, of theonomic reconstructionism, of over-realized eschatology, of post-millennialism, that we're going to conquer the world for Christ before he comes. These false teachings that have variously been associated with people coming out of the IHOP in Kansas City in America and uh, the restoration movement in Britain, people like Gerald Coates, Roger Forster, um, Terry Virgo, these things are completely false and have absolutely no biblical basis whatsoever. They have no foundation in God's word, and in fact are contrary to it. It's when the Lord comes back, we have dominion. He comes with the clouds. He does not come back for a triumphal church that's conquered the world. He comes back with one to establish his millennial kingdom. That was the belief of the early church. That's what the scripture teaches. Do not believe these other things like dominion theology and post-millennialism, they are false doctrines taught by false teachers. Do not believe such things. Let us continue. Daniel speaks directly that one like the Son of Man was coming, and of course he was coming with the clouds of heaven. So clouds basically are evaporated water. You have condensation, condensation right? You know, precipitation. What they are is essentially water. The water that comes out of the sky, what is it a picture of in Scripture? Again, we don't base doctrine on typology, but we use the typology to illustrate and illuminate the doctrine. Isaiah 44, verse 3, my apologies to those who know this. I'll pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I'll pour out my spirit on your offspring. These rains, and in Israel, it has a special prophetic meaning to Israel, former and latter rain, concerning the early church and the end of the age when God turns his grace back to Israel, the outpouring of the rain is the Holy Spirit, we're told in Isaiah. In Israel, this rain goes into the water table and through aquifers comes into springs called Maim Hayim, living water. In John chapter 7, verses 38 and 39, Jesus said, I'll give you the living water, which again, he said, it speaks of the Holy Spirit. So we're not basing the doctrine on the type. Jesus tells us exactly that it is the Holy Spirit, as does Isaiah. But it is a typology or typological illustration. Okay, let's continue looking now. The clouds. The clouds. Turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14, where we read about the rebellion and sin of Satan and his wanting to have a coup d'etat against the Lord God. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I'll make myself like the Most High. Satan wants to be worshipped as God in the heavenlies, in the Shemaim in the Orenos in Greek, Shemaim in Hebrew, in the heavens. He wants to be worshipped above the clouds. He wants to usurp God's witnesses, faithful Israel and the church. He wants to usurp that place above the Lord. Ultimately, this will be played out when the Antichrist and false prophet do what they're going to do in the tribulational temple of Revelation chapter 11. What happens in a physical temple concerning the Jews will illustrate what's happening spiritually. Satan is taking control of 
Christendom, not scriptural Christianity, not the faithful bride, but Christendom will be incorporated or is incorporated into the false religious system of the world, as is Talmudic Judaism, not Levitical Judaism, not real Judaism from the Moses and the prophets and the Hebrew scriptures, but the shambles that the rabbis have invented after rejecting their own Messiah and after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. The Antichrist, or the person of Satan through Antichrist, will, among other false religions, who he will unite, get control of both Talmudic Judaism and Christendom. Things today expressed in the World Council of Churches, Eastern Orthodoxy, Roman Catholicism, etc., and also apostate evangelicism. Let's continue looking now. Satan always wants to take his place above the clouds, the witnesses of and for the Lord. That has always been his goal. Now, this was true from even eternity with the fallen angels, but it's true on earth. The events transpiring on earth are a reflection of what has transpired and is transpiring in the heavenlies. We see this in the book of Job, in the book of Zechariah, in the book of Daniel, and in the book of Revelation, and in certain passages of the scripture, where Jesus said, now Satan is cast down, and so forth. But let us move on even further. Look at Proverbs chapter 25, verse 14. Proverbs 25, 14. Like clouds and wind. Now the word wind there, ruach, is the same word for spirit in Hebrew. In the Septuagint, it's pneuma, the same word for spirit in Greek. Like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of his gifts falsely. The gifts of the spirit are just that, gifts of the spirit. They are never given to a man or a woman. Never. Nobody has the gifts of the Spirit. They are given to the church through a man or a woman. The word here is charism, grace. You don't have the gift of prophecy if you have the gift of prophecy. You have the grace to prophesy. You don't have the gift of the word of wisdom if you have the word of wisdom. You have the grace to speak the word of wisdom when the Holy Spirit so empowers and prompts you. You have the grace. I have the grace. I don't have the gift of teaching. I have the grace to teach God's word and will one day be accountable for what I teach, according to James 3.1. These are God's grace. The gift is to the church. The people in the church who God uses are simply those with the grace to exercise those gifts, but the gifts are to the body, not to a person. Remember that. Those who boast in their gifts are completely off the wall in their thinking, doctrinally and theologically. But there's also a propensity to boast in natural gifts, people confusing gifts with what we might call natural talents. This relates, of course, to the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. He gives the gifts in proportion to the talents. There's a relationship between human ability and gifts, but they're not the same thing. They're not the same thing. Where much is given, much is expected. That's true. If you have a certain intellectual ability or an ability with foreign languages or biblical languages, God can use these things. But that does not make you a Bible expositor. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. We have people today building churches based on marketing programs, based on motivational psychology. What these people are doing is boasting in their own gifts, too ignorant to know that the gifts are, are, are false. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's simply their own human ability. At best, a human ability consecrated to God. But that's not good enough. It's good, it's necessary, but it's not good enough. To consecrate our human abilities to God, 
if you're a dentist being a medical missionary or whatever, if you're a, you know, a, a barrister, a, a trial lawyer, being an evangelist, presenting a case, God can use those things. But it's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit alone that makes it a charism. So what you have is what we would call pseudo-charismata, pseudo-charismata, when people in the church boast of what is natural human ability, at best consecrated to God's service, mistaking it for the empowerment of the Spirit. They're confusing natural talent with biblical charismata, which comes from the Holy Spirit. Now, God is so sovereign and powerful, he can take someone who seems to lack the natural ability and empower them in certain rare cases. Moses being an obvious one, he had some kind of a speech impediment. Yet he was God's spokesman, but Aaron was next to him as his assistant due to his lack of eloquence. God used that to keep him humble. That's quite a situation. That is, of course, one of the rare and unique cases, but we have to allow for it. You know, William Carey, the missionary to India who translated the scriptures into Hindi and so forth, he had a fifth grade education. John Bunyan, who wrote the great literary classic, The Pilgrim's Progress, in my view, after the scripture, it's the best book I ever read in my life. It's the Pilgrim. That is the best book I ever read in my life after the scripture. Well, again, he was not a formally educated man. God can empower somebody with his spirit beyond their human ability, intellectually and otherwise. In certain circumstances, he does it. Now, it's not an everyday thing necessarily, but God can and does do it. Do not think that you cannot serve God because you are not a formally educated person. God will require more from a formally educated person, and he will use a Paul to do things that Peter could not as aptly and as easily do, but God still used Peter as well as Paul, and that's true for us today. Be careful of those who boast falsely in their gifts when it's only natural human ability. Clouds and wind without rain. They may be witnesses, but the Holy Spirit is not in the cloud. Now let's look at this even further concerning a subject very important to us all. Look with me, if you will, please, to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11, verse 3, concerning the subject of revival. Ecclesiastes, which in Hebrew we call Kohelet, Kohelet, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11, verse 3. The book of Ecclesiastes, of course, is God's philosophy of life. God's philosophy of life. The Greeks had Aristotle and Plato. The British had Betham, you know, and Hobbes. You know, the, the Germans had 19th century rationalists like Nietzsche and Hegel. The existentialists in like Denmark and Soren Kierkegaard and so forth. They all have their philosophers. The French, the Russians, they all have their philosophers. Well, this is God's philosophy, these 12 chapters of Ecclesiastes. God's philosophy is simply this, the futility of life in a fallen world. It's all in vain. As it says in the Vulgate, vanitas vanitatem, omnie vanitas, vanity of vanities, it's all vanity. If you trust in this world, it's in vain. A wealthy person will end up just as dead as a poor one, and a powerful person just as powerless <laughs> as a disenfranchised person. It doesn't matter. Don't trust in this world. Love God and keep his commandments. A better world is coming, and a better eternity still is coming. That's what we should trust in. That's God's philosophy. In the meanwhile, make the best of a bad thing. Live as a Christ-like life as you can, and by the grace of God, glean as much happiness you can in a fallen world. But remember, this is not our ultimate reality. It is only a temporal reality. The real reality is what is unseen and what is coming. That's God's philosophy. We always have to bear that in mind when we approach Ecclesiastes. In chapter 11, we read the following 
in Ecclesiastes, in the third verse of the 11th chapter. If clouds are filled, they put out rain upon the earth. If clouds are filled, they put out rain upon the earth, and whether a tree falls towards the south or towards the north, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. Now, we deal with the typology of the trees and our teaching on temple typology. I refer you to that for the sake of brevity. Let's take the first half of the verse for our purposes today. First half of the verse, if clouds are filled, they pour out rain upon the earth. Clouds become supersaturated with hydrogen. That's what takes place. Then it rains. Then it rains when the clouds are filled. What fog is, is a low cloud. Now let's understand revival. Revival is not a lot of people getting saved, as we always say. A lot of people getting saved is the result of revival, the proof that it did or didn't happen. That's why we know these counterfeit revivals in Pensacola and Toronto and Lakeland, they're all nonsense. There was a real revival in the United States that began on the West Coast with the hippies, the Jesus movement in the 19, late 1960s, early 70s, that extended throughout North America and even to other countries. That was a revival, a real revival. I remember guys coming back from Vietnam strung out on heroin. They needed 100, even 120 milligrams of methadone a day not to go cold turkey. And they just quit cold turkey, quit smack, quit heroin, no withdrawal, nothing. Not just one, thousands of them. That's a revival. There was a revival in the Hebrides Islands in Scotland in the late 1940s with Duncan Campbell. That was a real revival. Most of the garbage you see today is a lot of hype and manufactured nonsense fraudulently misdefining itself as revival. But let's look at what the scriptures do say. Revival is God pouring out his spirit. What results are the manifestations of the revival? Large numbers of conversions and hopefully discipleships. There was a revival in Wales in Britain under Evan Roberts. Unfortunately, they lacked the discipleship and its effects did not last very long in most places. Remember, evangelism without discipleship will amount to almost nothing. But let's continue. I was always say evangelism minus discipleship is zero. Jesus never told us to make converts but disciples, and I've said this 10 million times, but it's important. No, revival is God pouring out his spirit sovereignly, causing it to rain, as in the book of Amos, chapter 6, as in Isaiah 44. But how do the clouds come? There's evaporation. You've got the clouds, the witnesses on the earth. Goes up into the atmosphere below the ionosphere, but in the atmosphere, and then an intensification of the mass of the hydrogen atoms, it's going to rain at some point. Splash, down it comes, the meteorolo meteorologists tell us, that you're going to increase rain when you have increased evaporation into the clouds. If you have waterless clouds, you got a problem. But if you have clouds on the earth who are witnesses and their prayers are going up, what goes up will come down. There is no formula for revival, but there are principles. Every revival begins by people praying for it. Even a small number of faithful people, but there was an intensification, almost a kind of meteorological and spiritual critical mass, where it explodes. The revivals of the Hebrides began with women meeting in a cottage praying for it before Duncan Campbell arrived. This is how it happens. People can pray. Secondly, it's the church repenting. 
and returning to its first love. When the church repents and returns to its first love and people pray, what goes up will come down. No, it's a sovereign move of God. We cannot make it happen. You cannot revive something that was never alive to begin with. It's not a lot of people getting saved. That's the result of it. It's Christians getting right and praying in earnest that God would pour out his spirit. If that is happening, you get this meteorological dynamic in nature, well, you get the same effect spiritually. That's what the text is telling us. If we are being what we're supposed to be, salt and light, if we are spirit-filled, our prayers will go up. Remember, in the most desperate of circumstances, Elijah, Eliyahu Hanavi, was a man who could make it rain. We have an old teaching we did maybe 25, 30 years ago, 30 years ago probably, from the book of Kings chapter 18 on Elijah, a man who could make it rain. I believe it's available on the internet. Well, let's look. Ecclesiastes 11.3. When the clouds have water, what goes up comes down. That's how revivals come about. No formula, but definitely principles. Let's continue. What happens when the clouds have no water? The epistle of Jude uses Midrash as a literary genre. It is, from a literary perspective, unique among the epistles in that whenever the other epistles use typology or Midrashic hermeneutics, they explain the meaning. For instance, Galatians 4, Sarah and Hagar, it gives this Midrashic exposition by Paul on how that relates to the law and grace. However, in Jude, we don't see such explanations. Jude was written to Jewish believers at an early point in the church. Its theme relates to the second Peter particularly. Nonetheless, there, there, Jude and second Peter are almost semi-synoptic in terms of their theme from, primarily. But let's understand he's writing to Jews who would have understood this typology and the use of Midrash as a hermeneutic. Uh, and and as a, not just as a hermeneutic, but as a developed, what we call, Haggadic literary form. It's a Haggadic literary form. For those who are interested in the Jewish background of, 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 of our Christian faith. Now we read about these people. He describes backsliders in the church as blemishes on our love feasts. They defile the Lord's table. They are blemishes on our agapes. These, in verse 12, Jude tells us, are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts. They come to the fellowship meals, which is how the early church met and worshipped. But when they feast with you without fear, they have no fear of God, caring for themselves. Clouds without water, carried along by winds. They're driven by wrong spirits, by wrong numaton. Waterless clouds. They're clouds. They're witnesses of Jesus' death and resurrection. But they're not filled and powered by the Holy Spirit. They're not living holy lives. They're not serving the Lord faithfully in the power of the Spirit. Waterless clouds. Clouds, witnesses, martyrion with water and ones without. That is the choice for every Christian. Are we going to be a cloud with water or a cloud without it? Now, in conclusion, I'd like to look, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up, harpezo, raptured, snatched away. That's the word harpezo, the Greek word for rapture is harpezo. Let no one tell you the word rapture is not in the scripture. Rapture simply comes from the Latin translation of harpezo, to be forcefully snatched away. We will be raptured, harpezo, caught up together with them in the crowds. 
to meet the Lord in the air. We're caught up in the clouds with the witnesses. Jesus will be there. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Ruth, Isaiah, Amos, Hosea, Peter, Paul, James, John, Matthew, they'll all be there to greet us. And what a time that shall be. This is indeed our blessed hope. The return of the Lord Jesus. We meet him in the clouds. If you're a saved Christian, you're a cloud. May the Lord give us the grace. May he infuse us with his hydrogen, as it were. May we all be clouds with water, faithful witnesses of the Lord Jesus and his coming. Thank you so much for listening. God bless. Tell somebody about the Lord and his salvation. My name is Jacob Prash for Morial Ministries. Mm -hmm.